can see how wisely the money has been spent. The trustees have tight financial control and work tirelessly to provide an amenity and a full program of activities, for example, yoga, art and crafts, history, music, and environmental projects. Would she also agree with me that it is important to promote this good news to a wider audience of potential users, thus securing ongoing financial income and, sustain and I can't even say sustainability benefits for all? I thank the councillor for his supplementary question. You're quite right. The trustees have done a fantastic job, and, and not just in the programmes that they're putting on now, but in the actual building itself. And they've opened up the entire roof space, and it's a really fantastic example of what you can do if you creatively look at a building. And from the ground floor, we've got great views over the commons now, really light space. Um, there's so much to it in the program of events as exhibitions that I have no hesitation in saying they have done a fantastic job. I don't think there's anything much I can add because there's something in those programs for absolutely everybody. Second supplementary. Councillor Fraser. Thank you. Um, and I thank councillors for their warm words for what is truly one of the gems of Bedford Ward and one of the reasons why I'm so proud to represent it. I speak to carry my interest as a member of the South London Swim Club, the Friends of Teaching Common and of the Teaching Common Mac, all mentioned in this question. But there was a slight omission for me whilst the Heritage Lottery funding was, was used to improve the common, would, would the Cabinet member agree with me um, the concerns that the, the money was used to, to chop down the trees on Chestnut Avenue? In a time when you say that you are increasing trees in the borough, surely, surely they, they should have been kept to help, ta help tackle climate change. I thank the councillor for her question. I've got to say I'm a little bit saddened that you've done this to my good news story. The uh, Chestnut Avenue was very much about health and safety. And had I been a cabinet member at the time, and I was on cabinet, I would have had no hesitation in also recommending that the trees were taken down. If anything is threatening health and safety, you have to act. We have no right when you cannot see the damage from the outside to take and, and just decide, oh, well, we'll just leave them up and we'll see what happens. And the councillor might always remember that one of the most damaged trees that was not showing externally was right next to the children's playground. So, no, I will not apologise for that. We made the right decision. And in time, Beach Avenue would be fabulous. Councillor Belton. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, question 16 of the Cabinet Member. Um, yes, the, the, the Wandsworth one-way system is of, um, is, is of particular uh, interest to me, um, not only as the Cabinet Member, but also as the Ward Member for, for Fairfield. Um, uh, I think we'll all agree it will, uh, it, will, it will be, hopefully, the cherry on the top of the regeneration of Wandsworth Town Centre um, when it gets built. And we're delighted that it, we are almost now at the point where it will get built. And I, I give particular thanks to the offices for the pressure they've been putting on TfL to actually um, get on with it. As the answer sets out, and by way of update, um, in order to actually see this project delivered, and that's what it really needs to be about delivery, um, TfL have brought forward a further redesign of um, the one-way system, um, particularly around the, the junction of Ram Street and Armoury Way, and will very shortly, again, if they have not done so already because it is imminent, um, go, out to, um, uh, go out to residents uh, with a letter explaining these changes and, and inviting uh, comments. But our expectation is we still have put one's worth money behind it. Our expectation is in our... Our demand really is that this project starts as soon as possible um, and our, um, our expectation is that it will commence in 2021 uh, with an aim of being completed by 2024. Thank you for the question. Um, I'd like to congratulate the council in bringing this to apparently a conclusion after a very long time and also the cabinet member for the 
a uh, very positive and considered way he's been answering questions tonight. It makes a welcome change from some of his colleagues, if I may say so. Uh, however, um, this particular project uh, looks like going 17 million over our estimate, which is no great surprise, no criticism involved in that. It's been a long time in, in the gestation. We committed to paying for 50% of it. Um, now it's 17 million further. I understand in negotiating terms, he'll want to stick to the figure, the, the headline figure of actual money as long as he can. Um, and I would do the same if I was in his position. But I hope he does recognize, does he not, that if the increase is 17 million, there's got to be at some point or other a level of negotiation if the council wants to achieve what is after all the council's objective. Um, thank you for the question. Um, we've been ready for this project for a very long time. <laughs> and we have committed Wandsworth funds to the project for a very, very long time. Um, what really increased costs is delay. And there we have seen significant delay on the part of TfL in actually being ready to deliver. Our funds have been committed. We have wanted to see action. We are still waiting for that. We are now positively at a point where we are going to see that action. We still have our funds, our 27 and a half million committed, although it is capped. Um, we now must get on, start building, start mitigating the risk of cost rising and get this scheme delivered because once it's delivered, it will be fantastic and our town center will look incredible. Supplementary, Madam Mayor. Second. Councillor Corsland. Yeah, uh, would the cabinet member, um, um, would the cabinet member uh, please comment on um, the strong possibility uh, and indeed the, the certain fact that we're going out to consultation on um, a, an amendment to Old York Road, one, one of the premier um, streets in Fairfield Ward uh, and indeed in, in town cent uh, the town centre in general. And, um, affected, either for good or ill, by the uh, amendment to the one-way system. Uh, I thank the councillor for the question, and, and he will uh, know we've discussed at length, both together and with TfL, um, with some, um, what's the word I'm looking for, some resolution, robustness, um, that um, Old York Road is an incredibly important part of our town centre. Um, we have a unique configuration in that we have this wonderful old York road next to our main train station, which is part of the jury journey into the rest of the town centre. And it, its character needs to be preserved and enhanced. And it has really flourished, I think you'll agree, in, in recent years. Um, thanks you know, largely to an incredible number of new businesses which have um, set up there, particularly restaurants, um, as, we, you know, as, we've, as we've recently discussed. But, um, the, the potential effect of the redesign on Old York Road has been one of our priority issues with, with TfL. And indeed, we have inputted accordingly into the letter that will go to residents, and we welcome their views. Um, we are also going to look um, at what Old York Road should look like in, in the coming years, and, and, and you'll have seen plans in our, um, in our, in our reports and budgets for um, looking at an enhancement to Old York Road. It's, it, 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 it's some time since that has been done, and as you know, there will be a significant amount of development in the area, um, and the, the, the views and responses of, of residents will, will definitely shape that. So uh, I'm grateful for the question because it gives an opportunity to uh, emphasize just how much time we've spent on this because we see it as, as absolutely critical to the success of the overall scheme. Thank you. Thank you. We now turn to agenda item six, report number one items for decision. I will now move reception of that report and ask the council to approve the recommendations on each paragraph. Paragraph one, housing revenue account rents and service charges for council dwellings and non-residential charges. Is the recommendation approved? Thank you. Paragraph two, proposed additions to the general fund capital programme. Is the recommendation approved? And we have speakers here. Councillor Carpenter. Thank you, Madam Mayor. 
I'm uh, grateful for this opportunity to uh, give a tutorial in uh, Wandsworth Council's finances to Council of Gillies India. The uh, special meeting of uh, Council at this time of the year normally looks at the whole financial imposition of the Council, current account, capital account and cash flow through the Treasury. Although it was on the draft agenda, the current account uh, is conspicuous by its absence this year. We can only speculate why, but the papers presented to the Finance and Corporate Resources OSC showed that there was a funding gap in the budget for next year and a 6.25% increase in council tax was required for the budget, more than 2% above the level which would require a referendum to approve. I assume that the majority party have not yet decided how to bridge the gap, whether to impose more austerity cuts on services, raid the reserves yet again, or hope for something to turn up, a Brexit bonus from Boris, perhaps. And this brings me to the main theme of my speech, the majority party's financial competence to run Wandsworth Council. For many years, Wandsworth Tories have claimed that the fact that Wandsworth Council tax is half that of neighbouring boroughs demonstrates their financial expertise. It does not. The reasons for Wandsworth's low council tax go back to its inception after the poll tax float riots in the early 1990s. Wandsworth's government grant was so generous that it was able to initially set a zero council tax, while neighbouring boroughs had to set council taxes of several hundred pounds. Over the intervening decades, the percentage differential has reduced, but a cash gap remains. In the 10 years that I've been a Wandsworth councillor, percentage increases in Wandsworth council tax have been broadly similar to those in neighbouring councils. So, no financial magic in the past decade under Council of Govindia. When I joined the council in 2010, it had around 500 million in the bank, but it was making returns of less than 1% per annum on its investments. With inflation at 2%, we were losing money in real terms. Meanwhile, our pension fund was making steady returns of 5% per annum. Had we invested our treasury funds as well as the trustees invested our pension funds, they would now be worth some 800 million. And Wandsworth residents would not have had to endure the austerity cuts they have seen over the past decade. But Wandsworth Tories didn't, and our cash reserves are still around 500 million. Overall returns have crept above 1%, but are still below inflation. I'm pleased to see that Wandsworth Tories have started to hear my pleas for better financial management. And some 15% of our cash is now invested in medium-term funds with a 4.5% return. And some 5% in commercial property with a 5% return. But it's too little, too late. Which brings me to the capital programme. Every year, there's significant slippage in the programme. 11 million this year. The reason this matters is that if we leave money stuffed under the mattress rather than investing it in the projects that benefit Wandsworth residents, we're not making the best use of our finances. This is not a new problem. I first encountered it some 40 years ago when I ran British Telecom International's capital programme. My solution was to over-allocate the programme by 15%. That way, despite the slippage, we still spent the budget every year. We see the same problem with the community infrastructure levy. We've had 21 million allocated to the Wandsworth one-way system for as long as I can remember. Hopefully, we might be able to start spending it next year, but it's currently dead money, which could have been better spent on something else. If by some miracle the project had been brought forward, we have plenty of money in the bank, which we could use to bridge any short-term for shortfall in CIL funding. In conclusion, Madam Mayor, Wandsworth Tories were the beneficiaries of central government munificence when council tax was introduced in the 1990s. Since then, they have sat on their laurels and failed to optimise their financing. In the 10 years I have been a councillor, Wandsworth Tories have flatlined financially. They have failed to optimise the returns on their substantial 500 million reserves and failed to effectively spend their capital programme. As a result, Wandsworth residents have suffered more austerity cuts than they needed to and have failed to fully benefit from Wandsworth's capital investments. Labour could and would have done better. Thank you.
Councillor Richards Jones. Uh, thank, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor, and, and thank you to the previous speaker. Um, it, it, it's a strange uh, speech to follow that one, actually. Um, and it, it's actually difficult to know where to begin to answer some of the things that the previous speaker just said. The papers he refers to, so that's Treasury Management and the Capital Program, um, came to the Finance and Corporate Resources Overview and Scrutiny Committee two weeks ago, um, at which the Labour Group had the opportunity to raise these concerns. They had the opportunity to scrutinise it in detail, having had the papers seven days in advance. And in fact, Madam Mayor, they said almost nothing about these papers. The capital programme was passed unanimously, without a whimper. The framework budget was passed unanimously. As for the Treasury management paper, Councillor Gibbons, who's Labour's spokesman on that committee, remarked that he thought the returns were looking rather healthy. So I do question whether the Labour Party and the Labour Group on the Council do actually talk to each other, Madam Mayor. I suspect they don't. But just to take some of those substantive points in turn, Councillor Carpenter knows, and he knows this because of his professional background and his expertise in this area, that the Council can't invest its own Treasury reserves in the same way that the pension fund is invested. He knows that for two reasons. Firstly, we're subject to different regulation and legislation when it comes to our own Treasury reserves. Secondly, our Treasury reserves operate on a different time horizon to a pension fund. A pension fund pays out decades and decades and decades after the capital is invested. Our Treasury fund doesn't operate like that, and it has to, in principle, be ready in at least five years for deployment. That's why you can't take riskier investment strategies. That's why you can't play the longer game, because the capital is there for a different reason. And I'm really very surprised that Councillor Carpenter chose to make that point. But stepping back, because what this debate's really about is ca about council tax and about our financial management. And you know, when I, when I first heard that the Labour Group wanted this debate, I actually, well, I was quite cheered. I thought, hang on, this is playing on home turf. I mean, this council made its name, and this Conservative group made its name through value for money, through sensible, sound financial management. And that's why actually we bucked the trend in elections in the last 40 years. And actually, why at the last election, the Observer noted that Wandsworth wasn't so much a borough, but in fact a political phenomenon. And I was really gratified at the last election that I thought this group had finally, after 40 years, had won the argument on the moral case for lower council tax. I remember the Labour group sending out leaflets in every single ward they stood in, promising the same low council tax should have been in square brackets, as the Conservatives, because they recognise that it's particularly for our poorest families that that policy is a real boon. And I'd also like to thank and congratulate the Labour group that having spent 40 years having this argument and having it being endorsed and now won that low council tax is important, it's now taken a year from them opposing the budget, but conspicuously not having a counter budget of their own, that actually they've now agreed with the framework budget that was proposed at the last FCROS meeting. So not only do they agree with how we charge council tax and the level we do that at, they also agree with how we spend it. So I chalk that up as a win, Madam Mayor. I want to conclude my remarks by just saying this. We should inject some reality into this debate going forward. There will be challenges with finance. And Whilst there aren't any easy answers to this, and I remember the slogans at the last election where the Labour group said they would open up the books and they'd cut waste. I just say in the last 10 years, this council has made savings of 150 million. In the last five years, it's made savings of 50 million. There aren't easy ways to do this. And we would welcome any suggestions for sensible savings. But my challenge to the Labour group is this. You've got to move away from the sound bites and you've got to propose specific things. Until you do that, you won't be seen as credible on finance, and the borough will keep con returning Conservative councils. Thank you. Councillor Gasser. Thank you. 
Well, I was actually um, expecting to speak on revenue budgets this evening because that's what I'm interested in for children's services, but we don't have any revenue budgets here. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about what I know about. And what I, I'm going to pick up from where I left on in, off in last October in my speech. Your government has decimated council services. In Wandsworth, our school's funding has been cut to the bone, as have youth services, adult services, and everything else in Wandsworth. You call it making savings, I call it your government has made swinging cuts, and that those have affected services terribly. Where our schools have lost 56 million. It's had an enormous effect. Just this week, I've heard of St. Alan Selms having to ask parents to fundraise for computers, and Graveney is having to fundraise for its music department. After my speech in October, Councillor Sweet asked me to retract something that I said about the paddock school for children with complex needs, that it had no increases for seven years, despite the great increase in numbers and complexity and need. He told me I'd got my information from an unreliable source. I had to tell him that my source was not unreliable. It was the school's forum, the meetings of the heads of Wandsworth, and he's welcome to check the minutes. And here's another reliable source, our chief executive. One of the first meetings I went to early in this term of the council was for voluntary sector groups. Mr. Martin spoke. He said how sorry he was he could not offer more support for the voluntary sector, but Wandsworth funding had been cut by 60% in the last nine years. It's more now. A recent survey by the LGIU, the local government unit, surveyed senior officers and councillors and members around the country. It found near universal disappointment, 97% disappointment in the government's progress in delivering sustainable funding. Once again, children's services and adult services top the list of immediate and long-term pressures the councils face. Special educational needs funding has been particularly badly hit. At every school's forum my meeting I go to, and it's the heads of every type of school and every type of early years provision, they all say how hard it is for them to meet children's needs, some of the children's needs with special needs. We keep hearing of children not being educated in school because the schools can't meet their needs. One mum told me last week her son only goes to school one day per week. So a vulnerable child is being disadvantaged even more and his mum can't go to work. 30% of families with a disabled child live in poverty in this country because their parents can't work. That's from the Joseph Rowntree Foundation. I remember a meeting last year when Councillor McDermott was cabinet member still and Councillor Ambash was demanding she lobby the government for more funding for special education needs. Don't you think I am doing, she said. So of course she was. We all know how woefully lacking the funding is. When I served on the council before, there was so much funding available to improve children's lives. Building schools for the future, aiming high for children, for children with a disability, sure start, London challenge. There was so much money coming in with the Labour government. The OSC was all very harmonious. We never had a crossword. Ten years later, how different it is. Wandsworth recently had an Ofsted report on its centre provision, which was very damning. Our education and health and care plans are taking much too long to be decided. They're of poor quality. They're not providing children with the support they need. Our special needs assessment unit service is in disarray. But how demoralising it must be for our officers to work in an environment of cuts and inadequacies. No wonder we're losing all our staff. I have to say, I think the majority party has taken its eye off the ball again, not seeing the problems the offset inspectors uncovered. We on this side have been talking about them for ages. Your government has cut 150 million from our budget, or you've made savings, whichever way you look at it. That's money for youth clubs, for schools, for social workers, for community resources. All gone. The result is we see our young men turning to crime and losing our lives. The whole of Wandsworth was subject to a Section 20 order last weekend, even Fursdown, where there was a horrendous stabbing in our local park in front of terrified families. You are presiding over a failed state for young people in Wandsworth at the moment. It is time we adopted the Glasgow approach to violent crime, addressing all the problems some families face. 
but we need the funding to do that. Councillor Sweet. Time's Councillor up, Gimindia. Councillor Gasser. Councillor Sweet, Councillor Gavindia, you need to be banging on the door of D Downing Street, demanding funding for the services our young people need. If you do not, you are failing a whole generation. Councillor Graham. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak in this debate, not least as I'd prepared my remarks on paragraph two of the next report and uh, was, was concerned for a moment I might not be able to speak at all, but it has turned into a somewhat wide-ranging debate uh, and I find that most of my remarks are actually re relevant to, uh, to what we should be discussing. Uh, it's also a pleasure to be back in the chamber after our extended break. Uh, in fact, uh, having spent a long time on the campaign trail in Peterborough, uh, where the election result was not quite the same as the one here. It's a pleasure to be back in the borough. Uh, I was able to congratulate Councillor Anderson a few days afterwards and, and do so again now. But although the opposition have every reason to be delighted with their gain here, it was their only gain in the entire country. And they, uh, they do now face the reality that their entire message in that campaign is defunct. We have left the European Union. We have rejected the fantasy economics of Corbyn and McDonnell, as they did in private, most of them, but not in public. And for all of Labour's pretensions, it is the Conservative Party who stand for and are supported by the working class. There is a direct relevance, Madam Mayor, to these issues, because there was a myth that they propagated about this council and was evident in their campaign during the election. The myth is the suggestion that for us, the market trumps all and the lowest price is all that matters. The suggestion that outsourcing is selling off a service on purely commercial terms. The suggestion that only an in-house contract can incorporate social objectives. This has never been true. Nothing is reducible to cost alone. Contracts have specifications. A, sleep, a street cleaning contract will tell you that a particular street has to be swept at these intervals and to this standard. So at minimum, cost is relative to uh, quality. And for any of our contracts, the spec that we choose embeds social value in some way, environmental benefits, community issues. But there are wider factors that are harder to capture or quantify in any figures. And it was for that reason the Conservative government passed the Social Value Act. Now, when you believe the myth that the market is trumping all, perhaps you can believe that the Prime Minister wants to sell off the NHS to Trump in defiance of all logic or evidence. Perhaps you can believe that austerity was a political choice and not the unwelcome necessity of clearing up your mess. Perhaps you can believe all that, but the country did not. And amusing as it was to note some of the people over there wandering around graveyards on Christmas Day, wondering what had happened, musing on the struggle, even growing beards, for goodness sake. Amusing as all that was, the national result could only shock those who were woke but not awake. If I have a concern, Madam Mayor, at all in these proposals uh, and on the social value proposals, is that they could be at all for wokeness in the wrong hands. There is always a danger in extending criteria beyond financial factors. And uh, local TOMS, which uh, I'm assured is a general neutral term regarding themes, outcomes, and measures, it's a good idea that needs to work in practice. But those concerns should not stop us improving the way we award contracts, supporting local businesses, promoting training and apprentices and opportunities for local people reducing the use of single-use uh, plastics and dozens and 